Uh, I'm also a reformed carbohydrate addict. And I think the discussion you hear is going to change because we're no longer under a protein love, it's a carbohydrate love. And in my clinical practice, I use what I talk about today just about all the time. So I, I'll give you the, the science and the clinical side of things. And I think if there's anything we've learned is that there's more than one way to achieve excellent health. You'll be reassured to know that you don't have to eat carbohydrates to live. It's not an essential nutrient. So one of the first things we learn in nutrition is what does the body not make and what do you have to eat? You won't find carbohydrate on this list of essential nutrients. I'm going to talk a little about what goes on in the body, not just what's on the plate, because as an internist, as someone who treats metabolic problems, I need to go out and know what's going on inside the body. So the way that humans use fuel, what you eat, fuel, is that you burn what you eat. We're omnivores. Dietary protein is mainly used for structure, so we're not going to talk about that. But if you eat carbohydrates and fat, then you will use both for fuel, and your respiratory quotient will be about 0.85. If you eat only carbohydrates, then you will burn mainly carbohydrates for fuel, and your respiratory quotient will be 1.0. And when you eat only fat, you will burn fat mainly for fuel, and your respiratory quotient will be about 0.7. This is taught in basic nutritional classes. And when you burn fat, fatty acids and ketones become the main fuel source. And if you haven't heard of fatty acids and ketones as a fuel source, I will introduce you to that now. Here are the popular diets in terms of carbohydrates per day on the y-axis and calories per day on the x-axis, with the diets in yellow limited in carbohydrates so much that your body has to burn fat. So on the far right-hand side of this panel, you'll see at the top, in diets that have lots of carbohydrate in them, you burn glucose for fuel. And at the bottom right, the diets that don't have the carbohydrate, you burn fatty acids and ketones for fuel. That's just the way we're built. There's nothing wrong with it. When you don't eat overnight, most of you are shifting to fatty acids and ketones for metabolism. Children are very effective at doing this. Diabetics are very poor at doing this. If you didn't eat for a day because you were sick, you're shifting to fatty acids and ketones. If you were starving for a protest for 10 days, you shift to fatty acids and ketones. That's just the way we are made. So how do you implement a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet in my practice? There are many different ways. And I say ketogenic because you're shifting to the ketones for fuel. You could have eggs and bacon, sugar-free yogurt with berries, chicken Caesar salad, a fast food burger without the bun, snack, olive, cheese stick, pepperoni slices, chicharrones, steak with blue cheese, broccoli, salmon with cream cheese, cream sauce, for drinks, water, sugar-free drinks, coffee with cream. Individuals choose the foods that they like from a list that I give them. It's a, a sheet of about 100 foods, and I say, eat what you want off this, but you can't eat off this list. It's a list of low glycemic foods. I'll talk about that in a minute. There are vegetarian low-carb options, but you don't have to be a meatitarian to be a low-carb eater. And I wonder if that's the common denominator between what we're talking about today, Dr. Uh, Professor Campbell. Maybe we're just saying the same thing in a different way. You can categorize carbs as good carbs and bad carbs, and the good ones are the vegetables, the bad ones are the refined products, the stuff that's made in America today, and, and uh, I hope you're not eating too much of it. Um, the popular diets can be put into different phases. There's a weight loss phase and a maintenance phase. And so if you're um, at a maintenance phase of a popular low-carb diet, you're basically eating like you're living in the Mediterranean basin, like a French person, a Spanish person, or Italian person. You're already at your goal. If you're my patient, I don't want you eating that way yet if you have weight to lose. You know, so no wine and, and, um, and baguettes yet, but eventually you can if you're at your goal. And there was just a recent study, again, about the Mediterranean diet out of Spain being a, a favorable thing to do in, rec in uh, recurrent cardiac events being prevented. Uh, excuse me, that was primary prevention of cardiac events. So how, how could this relate to cancer and, and metabolism? Well, you have to understand that lowering the dietary carbohydrate reduces the serum glucose and insulin levels. So sugar, which is sucrose, glucose, and fructose, 
raises serum glucose. So the sugar you eat, the starches you eat, raise your blood sugar. Starches like bread and pasta are digested to glucose. Having a teaspoon of potato is no different than having a teaspoon of sugar from your body's metabolism. I know it looks different on the plate. And I know you may have some taste and social aspects to the one food over another. But your body sees it in the same way. Insulin is secreted by the pancreas to lower that glucose level. Our body does not like an elevated in, uh, glucose level. We protect very carefully against the higher glucose level. But insulin, while it lowers the glucose, it also is a potent stimulator of lipogenesis, or fat storage, and it inhibits or stops fat burning. So lowering insulin levels allows an individual to use their body stored fat, and that's the basis of a low-carb diet for the treatment of obesity. Insulin goes down, the body wakes up to the fact that it has excess energy stored on it in terms of fat, it starts burning its own fat. So low-carb diets reduce the dietary contribution to serum glucose, which then lowers the insulin levels. This is so elementary, it's not even taught anymore. It's in the physiology books, and it's not emphasized in classes, I'm afraid. Insulin is also an anabolic hormone, a growth-promoting hormone, which is why this relates to cancer. So lowering insulin may lead to less cancer growth. Here's a figure that shows the blood glucose and insulin after meals in one of the best studies looking at a low-carb diet in an inpatient setting by Gunther Bowden in the Annals of Internal Medicine of 2005. And if you're not eating carbohydrates, these are the circles the, the, uh, in white, white circles, the blood sugar and the insulin doesn't go up after meals. So we teach that it's normal to have the blood sugar to go up after a meal, but it's normal only if you're eating carbohydrates. So I've been eating this way about 10, 12 years since the first study that I conducted at Duke, and my blood sugar doesn't go up after a meal because I'm not eating much carbohydrate. So just because it's normal, it doesn't mean it's optimal, okay? So we want to know what's optimal. I was uh, <laughs> helped out by a patient who gave me a book from her used bookstore from 1923, and she said, you might look up, uh, you might be uh, like this book. And I looked at what the diet was for diabetes before insulin was discovered. And basically, it was the diet that I was studying in 1999 and almost getting in trouble for studying this diet that was used by all the doctors in 1920 before insulin was discovered for diabetes. It's not new. It, it, if there wasn't medication for diabetes, we'd all be using this diet. Oh, I use this diet in my practice. There's a growing number of people. Most diabetologists don't go to this level. They just don't know yet. So here are the facts about low-carb diets, and I give an hour-long presentation about this. I can't go through all of it. Carbs are not essential nutrients. They lead to weight loss without talking about calories. You don't have to talk about calories. The appetite goes down, you eat less. And so um, at the bottom bullet, the thing that was most uh, unpredicted is that low-carb diets lower the metabolic cardiometabolic risk by raising the HDL cholesterol and by lowering the triglyceride. This is called the metabolic syndrome. There's so many studies now, there are meta-analyses, and if you Wikipedia medical research related, related to low-carb diets, the top 50 articles will be right there for you. These are not hard to find in your grant applications. The, the best study, the longest-term study, is the direct study by Shai et al. out of Israel. They, there's carotid artery level determinations. The carotid artery thickness goes down after two years if you're following a low carb, a high carb, or a Mediterranean diet. It didn't matter in that study. So look that up if you're still wondering if this is a healthy thing to do for your arteries. Obesity and metabolic syndrome, two large meta-analyses now by Nordman, published in 2006, and Hessian in 2008. Type 2 diabetes, the recent systematic uh, review and meta-analysis in 2013 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So times are changing in terms of the science for low-carb diets. So what about cancer? Otto Warburg received the Nobel Prize for talking about cancer metabolism being predominantly glucose metabolism, being glycolytic, being using, using the glucose from your body, using the glucose that you eat. Cancer cell glycolysis is the basis of the PET scan, a medical imaging procedure that lights up under aggressive cancers. When a, a Eugene Fine, who's a radiation oncologist, had an aha moment when he was doing a PET scan and he realized he was feeding glucose to cancers. Started to look this up and said, this is old news. Most aggressive cancers demonstrate a glycolytic phenotype, meaning they eat sugar, they eat glucose. 
even more, so Chen et al. in uh, Journal of Bioenergetics and Biomembranes um, 2001 talks about the Warburg effect and its cancer therapeutic implications. Tumor cells have overexpression of all of the activity that has to do with glucose, in bringing glucose into the cell and all the glycolytic, glycolytic enzymes. Drugs that inhibit or block the glucose transport are now being looked at as therapeutic targets for cancer. Tumor cells often lack the ability to use fatty acids or ketones as an energy source. So you may be starving the cancers by not eating the sugar. Now that's the speculation, but it's possible. And for some tu tumors, ketone bodies are even toxic for them. Wow, that's pretty important, and this is just food. To put this all in context, this shocks doctors, shocks medical students. There's five grams of glucose in the entire adult human, meta human bloodstream. If you poured out all your blood and measured the sugar or glucose in it, there's five grams. And it's so obvious, nobody ever looks at it. If you check your blood sugar, a normal blood glucose is 100 milligrams per deciliter. Any diabetic, they do it multiple times a day, 100 milligrams per deciliter is normal. I just did this for a high school class, uh, factor labeling, showing that with, assuming there's five liters of blood in the adult, so imagine in a child, it's much lower that there's five grams or a teaspoon of sugar in the entire human bloodstream. And now, if you're telling someone to eat 100 grams of carbohydrates per day, that's 20 times the amount of sugar in your bloodstream. 20 times. I'm amazed we're not all diabetic if we're all eating that way. Your pancreas is on overdrive keeping the blood sugar down. Animal studies, no problem. Steve Friedland at Duke has done several studies looking at um, animal models where you could put people, not people, animals on ketogenic diets, significantly reducing tumor volume. Another study, a non-ketogenic low-carb diet rich in canola oil was shown to reduce tumor growth and tumor cell proliferation in an animal model. Another mouse model of a glioma. So brain cancers seem to be particularly sensitive to glucose. Don't quite know why. Some cancers are more sensitive. I think the Warburg effect is going to be refined over time. Not all cancer ce cells are going to be glucose dependent or, or predominantly glycolytic. They're crafty things. But imagine if you just change the diet in combination with chemotherapy or radiation. Changing the diet. I can keep someone on a low-carb ketogenic diet for five years now in my own clinical practice. There's an art to it, but you, it can be done. Um, and the mechanisms appear to go beyond just a reduction in the glucose level. There are changes that occur in the metabolism, including lo lowering an in inflammation that occurs when you reduce the carbohydrates. Another study showing squamous cell and colorectal cancers being injected into mice, less growth, and a 10 percent diet and, and even a 15 percent diet reduced the incidence. Uh, Caloric restriction uh, is being compared to carbohydrate restriction. John Maropoulos, a student at Duke, found out that if he put people, put animals on the same calorie level, the animals on the low-carb ketogenic diet lost weight compared to the other calorie level. So a calorie is not a calorie inside the animal body or the human body. So they, in this study, found that out and then adjusted the calorie level, gave the low-carb diet animals more calories so that the weight was stable and then even found the same result that there were, was a less incidence of tumor in, the, in the, this mouse model. But you know, as you're going to hear in my rebuttal, the mouse model, the animal model, this just ain't good enough for a medical physician. And, um, uh, but there are some human pilot studies of low-carb diets and cancer. So they're at the level of can cancer patients tolerate a low-carb diet even at advanced stages. So there are two studies that I could find, Schmidt et al. and F Eugene Fine um, et al. And the low-carb ketogenic diet was well tolerated in these cancer patients. Jeff Volek is one of the shining star uh, nutrition and, and exercise physiologists at the University of Connecticut, has done a lot of the low-carbohydrate science. And in this study, he collaborated with an individual to look at what would be the best diet for reducing breast cancer. And so basically they're coming up with the, the same idea of reducing insulin, insulin-related growth factor, reducing inflammation. These are all in the literature as being correlated with cancer, especially breast cancer. And so they postulate that the optimal diet, dietary strategy that would be one that lowered the serum glucose, the serum insulin, 
reduce the adipose tissue, increase the HDL, and decrease the triglycerides. That's that metabolic syndrome that the low-carb diet is really good at fixing, and then decreasing inflammation. So in this paper, they provide the basis and great fodder for grant application backgrounds for the rationale for using a low-carbohydrate or a low-calorie diet, a calorie-controlled diet, for the treatment of cancer, published in 2012. I'd like to wrap up. Low-carbohydrate diets create a fuel metabolism using fatty acids and ketones. It's just what happens, minimizing glucose utilization. Low-carbohydrate diets are safe and effective to treat obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. Like Professor Campbell, I see chronic medical condi conditions go away. I can say the same thing, Professor Campbell, in my practice, using my approach all of these diseases go away. I think we're against the same, same uh, uh, problem, which is the typical American diet. And there are multiple ways to go about things. I wonder if the common denominator of what we're talking about is this glucose dependency of cancers. So avoiding glucose metabolism and lowering insulin levels may be beneficial for the treatment of cancer. And preliminary human prospective studies are being done to evaluate low-carb diets for the treatment and prevention of cancer it's in its infancy. Up until 10 years ago, there was a taboo on studying low-carb, high-fat diets. Nobody could get any grants funded. Now you can get grants funded. There are several studies being done in the U.S. and in Australia. The Australian group has, has had continuous funding for a long time. I would encourage you to look at the mechanism. You know, what's the mechanism of that's creating the cancer and follow the trail. I see studies that correlate high insulin levels with cancer and the scientists aren't thinking about, well, what raises insulin levels? It's the carbohydrates that raise insulin levels. So I'm just trying to be here to help you connect the dots between what you observe and, and maybe come up with treatments that are even better than what we have today in treating the chronic medical conditions of today, including cancer. Thank you very much.